Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will discuss college access and support for students in need with special guests, Elizabeth Devaney, CEO of Students Rising Above in the San Francisco Bay Area, Jacqueline Pinheiro, CEO of U Aspire, which operates in California, New York, and Massachusetts, and Cassie Motts, Executive Director of College Bound Foundation in Baltimore. So I'm going to set you up. We're going to go to you, Cassie, in Baltimore. Uh, Low-income students. Low-income students are more likely to drop out of college than their better better resourced peers, with fewer than 15% obtaining their college degree. So let's talk about entering to college, the challenges that we have, because it seems to me that, you know, people are our resource. People are the nation's future. And it seems that if we allow only those people with means to have um, access to that future um, through education, we are basically uh, cutting the legs out from under the future of our country. Cassie, how do you see this this process um, in terms of, of creating the America that we want through this educational system that we have? You're absolutely right that education is supposed to be the great equalizer, uh, the opportunity uh, for students in our country, and too often it's not. Um, Here in Baltimore, we work with public school students in Baltimore City, most of whom are the first in their family to go to college. We give them uh, financial aid and we give them college advising to help them get to college. And then once they're in college, we continue to provide support through Um, continued advising, as well as a financial piece. But we have found that the the advising piece is just as important as the financial support because so many of our students are the first in their families to go to college and they need the support to navigate. They are just as talented, if not more talented, than the students whose families have been going to college for many generations. But it's that extra support, um, knowing what forms to fill out, what to do when you first you, you get your first C. It doesn't mean you're not college material. It just means you need to go to the the um, the academic support um, advisor. So I agree with you, Mark, your, the, the premise of your, of your first question that um, we need to do better as a country in supporting everybody going to college. Otherwise, the wealth gap that is already widening between the rich and the poor will continue. I take myself back to my uh, clueless youth, uh, Elizabeth, mm-hmm. where, you know, mom or dad had to say 50 times, uh, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Right. But if mom or dad are unaccustomed to the rhythms required just to just to submit an application, it's really tough, isn't it? Absolutely. And we consider that navigational capital. And our well-resourced peers of our students have navigational capital built into their economic systems, into their educational systems. Um, they're the ones who are getting help filling out their college applications and their essays. For our low-income first-generation students, they're lacking that navigational capital, and we must support them, not only on an individual basis, but on a a group basis, so that this strata of of students can go on and diversify our workforce. Let's talk a little bit about uh, not the justice side. I don't want to talk about the justice side quite yet. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the interests of the nation. Uh, Jacqueline, in terms of of what is the interest of the nation in ensuring that we have as many educated people in the United States as possible and that we're not the kind of country where there's just a small elite that gets fine education and then the rest of us can just sort of fend for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's really what we're seeing happening day to day on the ground, climate change, energy sources, all of the things that as a society and as a global nation, um, we must create the educational pathways to ensure that not only we as the United States and as Americans have the opportunity to live in Um, a world and an environment that we want, but that we are also contributing overall globally. And so without an educated workforce and without an approach to education that is flexible so that students can move through and we can create a type of lifelong learning approach to education, we will not 
succeed in maintaining the tight and the level and the numbers of educated citizenry, not only to, again, deal with global issues, um, but to create the type of communities um, and allow people to define success in terms of what they mean and what they feel success is for their families and for their communities. So these young people, your point is, uh, are our scientists. They are the, our artists. The, poli- they the are politicians, the future yes. Teachers. They're the politicians. They're the policymakers. Absolutely. Right? But, but what, we're, what we're doing in the way our education system functions with the high expense, particularly for higher education and the lack of support, what we may be doing is, um, is um, depriving the country of access to the full um, um, energy of our own citizenry. How do we how do we deal with that, um, Elizabeth? Um, w- w- what is your prescription? You were talking about navigation, so you you basically broken down the workflows that result in success. How do you uh, break those workflows down? Um, and and what is your uh, prescription for um, improving the situation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, it's it has to be multi tiered. And this is a well-known, undersourcing our workforce is a well-known economic problem. It's been studied for decades. Um, What we realize now is we are in a workforce development crisis. With the effects of COVID-19 stalling the education of thousands of youth at various levels of matriculation. And concurrent with that, a civil rights movement that is putting pressure, well-pointed pressure on corporations and businesses to diversify their workforce We have to put more energy, not only on an individual level, to mentorship and wraparound services for low-income first-gen students, but we need to better fund our public universities. We need to open up new pathways, as Jacqueline mentioned, different ways, different resources through which students can matriculate into the workforce. It has to be a multi-tiered initiative. Okay, so multi-tiered initiative, what does that mean? So that means public funding, it means private funding, it means corporations and and businesses putting money into diversification of their workforce through partnering with nonprofits and public agencies. It means multi-interests being served through various corporations, businesses, the private sector and the public sector. So Cassie, do you do you see it the same way? Do we need to do an all hands on deck on the educational uh, system? And if and if you do see it the same way, then how do we convince our uh, our fellow Americans to invest in in education? Because that means higher taxes. Um, I do agree with what you said and with what Elizabeth said. Um, and certainly taxes are part of it, but taxes aren't all of it. And I'll take Baltimore, where I'm from, um, and where we do our work as an example. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, it's important to get everybody involved, particularly the corporate community. So we have many, um, in, in the wake of the growing civil rights movement um, over the past couple of years, we have many corporate partners who, as Elizabeth said, are particularly interested in diversifying their workforce now more than ever, which is great. And so what they've done is they've, they have reached out to us not only to establish scholarships, and again, this is corporate money, this isn't tax money, this is private sector money, scholarships and pipeline programs so that they get to interview students, uh, high school students and college students over the summer, um, have them into their workplace as paid internships, and then start to pay for their college degree. So again, that's on a smaller scale, but I think that there's enough interest in corporate America now um, that it's not just the government alone doing this. Certainly taxes are part of it. We have well-funded public universities here, um, but I think that um, the other the other um, uh, end that is served by that is that um, students get to, uh, it's, it's mixing two parts of Baltimore that don't necessarily often get to mix by um, exposing students through paid summer internships. Um, and we have a youth works program here, which is federally funded through the city of Baltimore, so that a lot of young people are being put to work in uh, places where they may not have had, you know, the, the capital, the access, the navigational capital that Elizabeth was talking about. So I do think that uh, corporate America um, is a big part of it. And I think they are, um, I think they are stepping up where, where I live. So are we breaking down the work, the workstation assembly line approach, uh, Jacqueline, um, 
we, if we look at education, we've had this, this idea of education that education unfolds in discrete segments. But mm. the real life of people who need money um, is that that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? You, you get educated, you have jobs. You, the, the difference between high school and uh, community college and then college um, those those are not strict divisions, and and the 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 internship job opportunity, the learning is is not just in a classroom; it's also on the job site. Um, how are you looking at this? And I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You you might have been making an independent point. Yeah, well, I was just going to say back to the last question of, yes, it, it involves the corporate sector. Yes, it involves a tax structure, but it also is a choice. It is a choice for our country to prioritize equitable and accessible education, period, end of sentence. I think the Biden administration, particularly as you aspire, looks at financial aid, um, you know, is trying to push doubling the Pell Grant and doing and making different choices for students, breaking down the systems that exist right now that make it so difficult for students, particularly I myself, I'm first generation, my, both of my parents were immigrants, coming to this country and being the first in your family and trying to figure out those systems, it's next to impossible without a support structure. So how do we break down those systems? How does the federal government, how does state governments agree to breaking down those barriers, which I know this is not the topic today, but is really rooted in structural racism. But to your point and to your last question, Mark, um, in terms of the workforce, universities still prioritize, and I'll use air quotes here, the traditional student coming out of high school and going directly into college, which maybe a few decades ago, was that was the path. But now that is no longer the traditional student. The traditional student tends to be at least in their early to mid 20s. They are working full time. Many of them have dependents and their traditional higher education structure does not meet their needs. And so there's an impetus on the institutions of higher education to become more flexible, to create different access points on board, off board, and make sure that that is an okay approach to education as workforce changes, need, changes workforce needs change, excuse me, and as personal interests change, as family needs change. That is, if anything that we've learned over the last 18 months, everything changes on a dime. And our, and our institutions of higher education need to push harder and make the systems student-centered rather than what, has, what they've been used to um, and what is more comfortable for them. I'm not sure that, that um, structural racism can become the, um, the uh, cause of, of every ill that we have in our education system. It's not that I deny structural racism exists, it certainly is a major force in this country, but there are also the whole. There's also the whole question of, of how we're organized, and and the the difference between people with money and without money, regardless of race. Um, if, if you look at this, and I'll, I'll stay with you, Jacqueline, since you since you raised <laughs> structural racism as a, as a cause, to what extent can we decouple? And I'm going to ask you to to, to decouple the income piece with the racism uh, element that is here. Uh, because if you look around the country and you look at places that um, are, are not diverse, you still have very much the same issues that you encounter in a very diverse city in a less diverse city or in a less diverse uh, region of the country, a rural area. So to me, that is showing that we have a structural issue with how we approach education and the cultivation of youth, that, that yes, it coexists with structural racism that may exist, but it seems to also be separate from, the, from just a characterization of racism. Because if we don't characterize the problems correctly, we can't really address them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll go back to one thing that you aspire is extremely focused on and, and building off of what Elizabeth said earlier, the multi-tiered approach. We have advisors in school working both with high school students and college students. We train practitioners to help them help students get through the FAFSA, get through DREAM Act, et cetera. But then we also have a policy and systems change team, which works to identify how to break down 
those systems and structures that keep people out from accessing the funds that are there to help make college more affordable, regardless of race, regardless of geography. Um, it is that structural system. And again, I'll, I'll focus just on the financial aid piece because that is our sweet spot. Um, the What you need to understand as a technical practitioner for federal Pell or here in California, the dream, uh, excuse me, Cal Grant, um, it is very complex and you can make what you think is, um, oh, just check this box or say this, that can put you on a totally different path. It can keep you from unlocking all the dollars that that are available to you. So again, regardless of race, regardless of geography, if those structures still exist as they do today, these issues will continue to persist. It's it's complexity. What a great answer. Uh, Cassie, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in on the structural racism issue. I mean, I think in I think education more than almost any other issue, at least here in Baltimore, is directly tied to structural racism because public education, of course, depends on local taxes, which right. depends on where you live. And here in Baltimore, we have a shameful history of redlining where um, you know people are were denied mortgages and had were forced to live in certain certain neighborhoods where there weren't many resources, and that directly leads to the quality of education that they have been getting for generations in the and city. the valuation of homes. Yes. Red so, line is, is know, much lower. So the tax base is much lower and so on. Exactly. So, Mark, I hear you say, you well, you can't blame structural racism for everything. And, you know, that may or may not be true. But for education, at least in Baltimore, um, K to 12, which leads directly to higher education, I think there is a very clear link. Mark, I'd like to weigh in here, too. Um, Clearly, these systems in our country are predicated upon the white middle class perspective. So if you're neither middle class or neither white, you are excluded from many of the resources simply because you don't have the navigational capital or the social capital to access them. And we incur imposter syndrome when students do go to college. We incur a lack of confidence. We see our students really struggle with their own sense of agency and self-advocacy. And that's what we work at Students Rising Above to help them accrue through our program so that they can then go on with a, with a sense of confidence. Because the way our systems are set up on that middle-class perspective, primarily white, our students are often left out. Yeah, I, th- I think the point that, uh, that I'm making is, is not that structural racism doesn't exist. What I'm what, what, the point that I'm making is that if you heal racism, but you don't heal poverty, mm-hmm. um, you're you're also not going to resolve the issue. And and poverty and racism is also are also connected. So it's it, it's not that things aren't aren't totally connected. It's that the the tool set that we apply here can't be unidimensional. If we're if we, if we think that we have a silver bullet. We're just missing the point, and and we just took a couple of polls which seem to endorse uh, some of the ideas that that uh, you put out. Um, the first poll was that we had a hundred percent response that um, that higher education is either extremely important to uh, to a young person's uh, future or or um, still very important. And then the the other poll, which I thought was was really more interesting, we we said to your knowledge. What are the three main reasons students drop out of college? 78% said uh, financial hardship. Um, There was also um, an interesting uh, and high response on mental health and work-life balance. In other words, being able to balance the needs of income and and, and other uh, areas. And then there there are a whole range of other lack of mentorship and sponsorship, um, didn't find it to be particularly useful. Um, uh, 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 learning executive function and other issues that make it uh, difficult to stay in. So to to at least my sensibility, um, there are a whole range of different causes. So let's talk a little bit about Jacqueline, what what are your programs uh, shaped to do? And then we're gonna go uh, to Elizabeth and uh, and Cassie. Uh, Talk about your specific programs and how you shape those to address these various issues. Absolutely. So with our advising program, we start in 11th grade, 12th grade, as that is the critical point where students 
begin the process of identifying the funding available to them. We do focus on students with the intersectionality of first, first gen, um, identifies BIPOC students and who are coming from low income communities. And so it's critical that we break down those systems so that they can maximize their federal Pell here in California and in New York specifically um, maximize state-based aid um, and also for students who are um, eligible for the DREAM Act, ensure that they get funding through, through those channels. But it's also important that there is an understanding of the cost of college. So how much, if you wanna to go to a certain school, at the end of the day, what is it going to cost? And that is an issue on transparency. Institutions of higher education are not transparent outside of what tuition and fees are. That's pretty straightforward for the most part. But then when you break it down, the challenge with financial, um, the financial hardships, which I'm sure many of the poll respondents um, would, would agree with me is food, books, transportation, all of the indirect costs that make up the total cost of college. And those are the egregious, non-transparent costs that a student and a family cannot understand when they're trying to make a more financially um, informed choice. And it contributes to dropout rates because, Correct. you know, as, as you're trying to sort of figure it out, as these costs start to accumulate yes. within the process itself, it could make this untenable. The other point that I think you're making, which is just an excellent, excellent point, is this whole idea is that when you are, are um, when you need money, the return on investment of an education is so immediately important, right? How quickly will there be a return? Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about how you and students rising above break down this, this, uh, this problem and start addressing some of the impediments from your perspective? So we, we really have two core programs. One is a legacy program that has evolved over 20 years of iterative learning through which we've built out wraparound services for our students. So they receive financial literacy. Education is one of the first components of our program. So they consider their college and education as an investment and make choices so that when they exit the program, they are not saddled with years and years of college debt. Our second program is something that is much more emergent. And um, as part of my research, we've been really studying the agency and self-advocacy that a student feels. So we've created a program that's predicated upon the tenets of self-determination theory, which argue that if you satisfy the three psychological needs of autonomy, belonging, and competence, you can create intrinsic motivation. So we'll be we're conducting a randomized controlled trial of this particular program at the University of California, Riverside this fall to determine amongst their first year students what the persistence increase is through applying this program. So we're really trying to use, you know, we're working in humanities, we're working in life sciences with our students, but we're really trying to apply scientific approaches because this is a large scale, pro, uh, large -scale problem that will have long-term economic impact for our country down the road if we don't actively solve it. We got a question. It's very interesting, um, and, and Cassie, I'd love I'd love for you to um, to respond as you also describe uh, your programs. Um, college and and the structures of college um, are not necessarily suitable for every single type of profession, right? If I want to go into video editing, there's more of an, a, an apprenticeship approach, right? Going into a college, book learning, sitting in classrooms, and so on, as opposed to sort of interactive hands-on. It's one of the reasons why Hollywood has its kind of apprenticeship kind of kind of approaches. Uh, construction can be like that as well. Now, engineering, you might you might benefit from mathematics and classroom um, uh, um, work, but if you're going to be in construction, uh, you have to have some hands-on uh, elements to it. Um, how do you is is that part of the education process less in your bailiwick and your and your focus uh, on the the college as college experience, Cassie? Um, how we, do you see it? We do actually meet our students in Baltimore where they are, so that there is a Baltimore has a um, very strong CTE career and technical education program where students do get that hands-on apprenticeship learning. Uh, be it construction or welding, which is a very high paying profession um, mm -hmm. for which you don't need a college degree. Um, so we do work with the city schools there. And, you know, our school system is, is pretty small. 
um, we only graduate about 4,000 seniors a year. And of those, only about half go straight to college the fall after they're, they're um, graduating from, from, um, from high school in the spring. So um, further to answer your question, like the others have said, Elizabeth and Jacqueline, we have, we have a high school side of the house where we do um, college advising in the high school. And then we have a pretty robust and growing um, college support system, college success program, which has shown remarkable results even during COVID. Um, our first cohort of students just finished um, college. The, the program is now four years old, our college completion program. And 80% have stu students graduated or will graduate next year um, within five years, which com compared to national data and certainly compared to Baltimore City data is very high. And we think the secret of our success is really the, um, the mentoring from both peer mentoring and adult mentor um, um, in their profession, their chosen field, but also a college bound person staying with them. Um, I think that combined with the financial piece is key. It's, it's a very, you know, these models are expensive because they're very labor intensive because you really do need that person. You feel comfortable texting it to in the morning or when something goes wrong. And, you know, there's, you, there's no replacing having a, a, a trusting adult that a, that a student can talk to. Yeah. I'll also, Mark, if I can jump in really quickly, I think one of the interesting ways that that question was answered is how do you or, you know, the nonprofits identify students? And I'll use Elizabeth's word. It needs to be a holistic conversation with the student for the student to feel the advocacy, the empowerment and the agency to choose what is the, the best path for them at this point in life. And again, this I'm going to bring back the flexibility approach of education needs to have on and different on and off ramps consistently, depending on the way a person's life changes. And if they want to start in college, absolutely, the support structures need to be there. And then if they want to make a different choice for themselves, the money to case to Cassie's point, the money and the supports need to continue to follow that student based on their choice. It's not you aspire determining what kind of student they are. It is supporting the student's decision and identifying all of the potential resources that will, will help them achieve maximum success. Such a great point, right? It isn't paternalism, it's support. It's listening as much as, as, much as, as suggesting, yes. right? Um, uh, we're gonna give you, Elizabeth, uh, the last word. I just wanted to point out, we just finished a really interesting poll where, where we said, what would improve a, a student's odds of completing college? 70% uh, talked about grants. In other words, uh, reducing the financial burden. And then what was interesting is we had 50% say rent and living expenses, hmm. right? So those ancillary costs uh, would an ancillary support would would be helpful, Elizabeth? We're going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. What do you think we ought to be doing here as a nation? Because we we have, if you look at the patchwork quilt that we have, we have nonprofits like yours creating these solutions for their communities. Very very important. But there must be some way that we can take the learning that you can contribute and create some sort of national policy. Elizabeth, yes. tell us, tell us how, we, how we should go. Absolutely. I mean, I really think about our work as not-for-profits. If we do our work right, or if conditions were the way we wanted to, we wouldn't be necessary. This should be a government-led initiative because it is about the government or the country's well-being long-term and the well-being of its people. So we need to make college more affordable. We need better funding. I know this is something that you hear ad nauseum, but it is so true. We've got to double the Pell Grant. We've got to increase all of the mechanisms financially that allow students to, to matriculate easily into college. And we, start, we need to start creating some supports that can help students who have lived through years of economic marginalization, racial oppression, to begin to see that they too have the capacity to participate. And one of the things that we struggle with, at least at SRA and, and according to research is very prevalent, is students not believing in themselves. And if we can help students begin to see their own potential, we're able then to connect them to resources. And if policy can create those resources easily accessible by these students, then we are going to see our workforce diversify. We're going to see a much more well-endowed 
community that we have uh, through which we have workers available and we have thriving gig economic systems and we're going to achieve a greater level of social justice, which is why we're here. To me, it seems that that this problem gets resolved when we we each decide that it is worth our tax dollars to invest in schools that we would want to send our own children to. If we can do that, if we can create high schools, um, uh, public schools and community colleges that we would all want to send our children to, um, then we have there there an answer. It's it's an answer that crosses uh, racial boundaries, uh, income boundaries, and as long as we, we look at the school landscape and we say, no, 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 if I have wealth, I'm going to send my kid to a private school, we've got a problem and, yeah. and it affects the entire nation. Thank you so much for sharing the wisdom that you have and that your, and your programs of your staff, Elizabeth Devaney, CEO of Students Rising Above, Jacqueline Pinheiro, CEO of You Aspire, and Cassie Motts, Executive Director of College Bound Foundation. Thank your staffs, thank your boards, thank your contributors, and thank you for your insights as, as, as we try to understand this really uh, important problem. Have a great day, everyone mask up and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us.